Hi. Um, I'm not actually sure if anyone is here <laughs> from the five of us who should be six. And uh, hopefully uh, Zenos, who was just on, will return momentarily. Um, but I'm going to go ahead notwithstanding. And we've been asked to discuss uh, dialogue in the arts. And so we're going to have a dialogue about dialogue. I'm going to just speak very briefly to go, th go through a few of the things that came to my mind uh, regarding this topic. And then we'll each uh, speak in turn in alphabetical order by first name uh, and hopefully be able to have some discussion out of our dialogue. Um, so, I mean, the question is, what does dialogue have to do with the arts? Uh, first of all, there's the dialogues involved in the making of it. For instance, in its collaborative dimensions. And then uh, there's the dialogue with those who make uh, the artworks public manifestation possible. Uh, Dealers, curators, editors, publishers, producers, uh, patrons, and so on. For those of us who, who, who write or who make art in other ways, all of these uh, discussions enter into what we do and, and how we do it and how it's seen. But that said, the dialogue involved in making a work of art is not only with other people. There's also the artist's dialogue with the materials of their art. Uh, those materials, paint, sounds, words, whatever, never do exactly what you had in mind when you started. The materials always resist. And then you've got to negotiate with them. In the process of working, your conception of what you were doing changes, which is to say that the artist is always changed by doing the artwork. And while it might seem merely metaphorical to call this exchange between artist and material a dialogue, for an artist who's steeped in it, it is something very real and very concrete and probably the most important dialogue of all. But then beyond that, there are all the dialogues about what's already been done in art. This is broadly speaking the realm of criticism, the kind of dialogue into which I've entered on a professional basis. But there's also the informal criticism that involves anyone who talks about books they've read, paintings or films they've seen, music they've heard. This dialogue takes place wherever people engage in aesthetic judgment, which as Immanuel Kant said, always aims at a sensus communis. We have differing opinions uh, on the things we experience, and even respecting those differences, we aim at an agreement. The hope for universal agreement never arrives, of course, but aiming at it allows for the communication and clarification of our thoughts and for us to reach a certain mutual understanding. But what I've just said assumes the difference between a finished work and a work in process. I don't actually think that's entirely tenable. I'm a great believer in Marcel Duchamp's view, usually paraphrased as the viewer completes the work. It's a dictum I repeat regularly, in fact. Actually, what Duchamp proposed in his original wording was this. The creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator brings the work in contact with the external world by deciphering and interpreting its inner qualification and thus adds his contribution to the creative act. But to say that the viewer completes the work is to believe that the work can never really be completed because as long as it still has life in it, others will always be making their own contribution to its ideal future. In that way, the artwork is not so unlike political institutions, which always have to be remade, as Hannah Arendt pointed out, like the Constitution, which always needs to be reinterpreted, 
or democracy itself, which must either be extended or wither away. If you're a writer and poet like me or any other kind of creative artist, all these levels of dialogue can sometimes seem terribly irritating. So many distractions from that one essential dialogue with the materials of one's art. While the coronavirus pandemic was devastating for musicians and theater people and so many other performing artists, a lot of the writers and painters I know found their work flourishing under lockdown because so many distractions, so many extra interactions had been muted. And eventually it was necessary to re-enter these other dialogues, to let the work one had done be submitted again to the aspiration for a census communist. I remember something else that Duchamp said, the great artist of tomorrow will go underground. He never recommended staying there. For those of us who in this period experienced a kind of detachment from engagement with the wider world, a return to dialogue may be welcome. So uh, that's my, my kind of little statement about dialogue. I don't know if, if anyone wants to uh, comment or uh, question or attack uh, what I've said, or, or, or should we just go on to, to everyone else's comments in, in turn? I thought the part about bringing COVID into it was really interesting because it has really affected dialogue, and I hadn't even thought of that the profound effect it's had on my work and being out of community for so long. Yeah. I mean, it's been, it, it was a very strange thing. I mean, it certainly made me uh, sort of re reconsider my priorities about what I was doing. And to a certain extent, um, uh, well, uh, I, I, really questioned a lot my work as an art critic and wondered what the value of it really was when somehow life itself seemed to be uh, in the balance. Uh, you know, wondering if it was really worth doing. And then I had the remarkable experience of realizing uh, that in terms of writing poetry, uh, I didn't even care whether it was worth doing. I was just going to do it, whether it was worth doing or not. <laughs> and so uh, that sort of revealed another level of inner, inner necessity uh, yeah. that I hadn't distinguished before, I think. Hmm. I'm going to unmute myself now. Um, I think it's fascinating um, with, in, within the context of COVID, the effect that it had on visual artists and the effect that it had on performing artists, because visual artists um, certainly have more time to, for introspection, for looking at what's going on in society and creating something new, perhaps even inspired, being inspired by, by uh, have that solitude um, for musicians and performing artists if you're if you're a composer you can do the same thing if you're a performer you feel like you're a fish out of water you're completely removed from your medium and it's actually very hard to 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 connect to each other and um i did a project where we recorded uh for the first time you know i recorded my my part in in the united states someone recorded their part in germany a composer was based in New York. Someone else was in, in Finland. I mean, and it all came together. And that was exciting because it had never been done before. But at the same time, you know, the emotion of it, the experience during COVID was so alienating uh, because you're completely removed from performing arts, uh, which was a huge challenge for, for all of us. But I, I can see how it must have been incredible to be able to just focus on the art uh, during COVID. So. In a funny way, uh, what you're most implying is that for the performing artists, the, the audience or the public is actually part of your medium that it, you're working yeah. with. <laughs> and so Absolutely. you don't have the same uh, detachment. Um, I think we, we should uh, 
go ahead with our uh, individual statements. And then again, as with this, have a little bit of discussion after each one. Uh, Ranton, what's your, what's your view on dialogue in the arts? Yeah, so um, I was actually going to respond to what you were saying, but then I just decided to wait and roll it all together. I wasn't um, wasn't really sure about what I was going to talk about. And then um, I found it really interesting you talking about RN, because I was also thinking about Hannah Arendt. Um, and like in The Human Condition, she talks about tables a lot. She's really into tables. Uh, it's like a big metaphor for her. And it's like one of the things that interests her about tables is that they separate people from one another, but they also relate people to one mm-hmm. another. She and, would have loved Putin's table. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So, and I think that this is something that that our culture stuff can provide. So it's like we, you know, it's like we have like museums that are tasked with things like you know, telling a story, telling like a national story. And there are like really intense debates around um, national stories. Um, So I was just um, listening to today the, an event, um, some professors were talking and talking about the ways that like World War II is taught within Russia, which is it as this kind of like patriotic, like war that to my knowledge it's not it's world war ii is not taught that way um in other countries and thinking about things like the civil war versus like the war of northern aggression and so a lot of these i think that a lot of these debates can become like really tense like when they're when you just have like people arguing against one another and it's like you're wrong and you're wrong but it's like art and culture provide this space in which it's like a thing that separates us that that relates us to one another and we can have a debate around like okay well like I think this means this thing or I think this means that thing which gets a lot to criticism and the audience or the viewer completing the work and that this is you know, possibly like a a safer way than people just like going at it with one another, that it provides us like this thing in between that people can like argue over, debate over. Um, And it also like, it can, I think can also help to um, like bring stuff into like awareness. I think like it's you. interesting, though, for me when you when you bring up the museum, uh, that immediately raises another question, which uh, neither of us has brought up yet, which is how how people get brought into a dialogue. In other words, there's, for instance, I mean, on a very basic level, in an art museum, there. Are, always people who disagree about uh, whether there should be explanatory labels uh, for artworks or uh, is that a kind of um, imposition of of a curator's or an educator's interpretation on the viewer and why not let the viewer have a kind of more unmediated experience but then many uh, people who go into a museum don't necessarily feel comfortable being so to speak left alone with the artwork and they want guidance and they feel alienated if it's uh if it's withheld from them so there's always the question of the degree to which you invite others to dialogue uh versus so to speak letting them approach you uh, to enter into the dialogue. Yeah, I was just remembering like a museum intervention that I did with like a friend of mine. And as soon as you're doing like a weird thing in a museum, people are like, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing that? And it's like, it's, I find it so interesting because it's like, it's like, this is like the one place in the world (laughs) where you can go and you don't have to be like, 
what is this good for? Like, why are you doing this? It's like, this is the one place where you can be like, this is a thing that I'm doing because I'm doing it or because like I, I want to do it or I think it should be done. Um, and it's, um, and this is like, I think why I think that art is like, it is so important is like, there's a Lori Anderson interview where she says like, I became an artist because I wanted to be free. Um, which like for her, I think means like, I wanted to be able to do the things that I want to do rather than having it um, be, you know, what someone else wants me to do. And as we think about the future of work and labor and people having more like free time and these conversations we were having around the productivity and work satisfaction, the great resignation, a lot of these issues are very on the surface. To publicly do what one wants to do, though, uh, takes the, the assistance of a great many other people, usually, and who they either have to want you to be able to do what you want to do, or at least they have to acquiesce in your, in your doing that. And um, it's very difficult to get to that point of being able to, to get that acquiescence. So the last thing I'll say, I just dropped a link to Harold uh, Becker's Art Worlds, which is a really important text in the sociology of art. And just so you look at the cover and it's like the guy like carrying like the painting. And so there is this, so he's talking about like art worlds that it's like, there's yeah. all of these people that come together and we think about, you know, things that kind are kind of annoying, like, we think about like auteur theories of film where it's like, oh, this is like a, this is like a Hitchcock film, you know? It's not like he's, it's like his work. It's not, it's not the actors, it's not the writers, it's not the person behind the camera. So the ways that we think about like how different people participate in work and how those value systems get created is also, I think, really fruitful. Elizabeth, what do you think? Well, um, I was gonna, pursue the idea of art as being a language of its own, uh, with its own metaphors and uh, syntax and vocabulary mm -hmm. that's different from other languages um, and foreign to many people, a foreign language to many people. Um, and at the same time, art's an antidote to language. It's the workaround that allows us to connect in spite of all our differences. Um, in my daily practice, I'm largely mute. Uh, painting is generated in the right hemisphere and speech in the left. And so after hours and hours of brain engagement, I find myself completely wordless. Um, I liken it to the state one reaches in meditation. Um, it's this mental place that's really beyond word. Uh, as I work turning my ideas into imagery, I'm keenly aware of how the rest of the world might react. And I work with the syntax and the vocabulary of art to affect people's reactions. Um, I try to coerce the world to see things as I do. When the work hits the walls of a gallery or a museum and the rest of the world wants to absorb it, the dialogue begins, although many people find the language of art to be a foreign language. Uh, my very personal approach is that I want to be understood. I want to affect change. I do not, as an artist, wish to be inscrutable. Uh, I want to sensitize my fellow human beings to the sacredness of the natural world. And if you've never sat with your back to a tree or stared at a stream flowing by, I'm speaking to you. Um, I'm attempting to stir you emotionally. And here's where representation becomes uh, the antidote to language. Uh, the message will be packaged in forms that mysteriously force you to notice I want the work to hit people between the eyes, and this is not really dialogue. Uh, making art in this way with this mindset is not unlike the way ancient stained glass worked, light passing through color as a way of telling stories to people who could not read and to whom services had always been delivered in a foreign language. Uh, on one level, it's essentially didactic, and yet as art, it also seeks to reach beyond the mission of instruction and it's uh, acting as the antidote to language once again. Recently, during the course of a six-month exhibition of, of my work during COVID times, 
I had to conduct multiple small gallery talks uh, to small groups, uh, mostly of non-artists. At first, I talked about the experiences that engendered the work. Um, those experiences usually involved adventures. So people loved the adventure stories. Um, and that's how I talked about the work. But in giving all those gallery talks, I had to think hard about what it was I wanted out of the viewer. What was I trying to get to? As time wore on, I grew bored with the storytelling approach and thought, what if I gave these curious non-artists some tools for decoding the work? Um, if you're an artist, perhaps you've noticed among your audiences a real lust for that kind of tool. People seem to want to grab onto whatever life raft of understanding you offer them. I used to use titles as a path into the work because most people are more comfortable with words than they are with images. For example, if the title describes the work as a meditation, they will see it that way. I can manipulate the viewer's perceptions with the words that I used to name the piece. In my later gallery tours, I decided to talk about the way certain marks cause humans to react and the component parts that art's constructed of and which ones I leaned on and why, to, and why I leaned on them to create a certain reaction in the viewer. I noticed that when I gave viewers these ideas to work with, they became enthusiastically engaged with the work. They started to see layers of meaning beyond the titles and the obvious representation and dialogue erupted. The gallery talks talk started taking a lot longer to conduct because there was so much to talk about. It seemed to me that what had been needed all along was an art translator to decode this foreign language. The viewers were smart and curious, so having a few simple tools deepened their grasp immediately. I believe we can foster dialogue if we as artists take time to do some teaching, some translating of this rich foreign language. That's my piece. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm interested in this idea of the art translator because in a sense it uh, seems to imply that there is another language other than the language of the art itself that mm. you know that can be uh, the equivalent so that uh, someone can who doesn't understand art can understand what the artist is trying to do or say um, but that still seems to kind of leave leave the art itself behind. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, know, I, I think one of the very best ways to look at a at a piece of art and have dialogue of the kind that you you've been talking about is for an artist or a critic or somebody who sees visually, who sees forms, lights, and colors, particularly, just stands in front of the work and talks, reacts. Uh, moment by moment, uh, a, a, in a spontaneous, improvised way, because that's the way we actually do look at art. I mean, really, that's not what we're doing when we write about art. We compose it, we make it nice, we make it pretty. But when you look at it, it's a succession of moments and tangents and internal conversations. And I think if you want to teach somebody how to look at a visual image, the best thing to do is really especially early in their, in their learning about this kind of thing, just stand there and talk in an undidactic, spontaneous, free-flowing way. And you say, oh, look, this little triangle here, look, look how beautifully that mirrors this diagonal over here. Why does that make us happy to see this diagonal connecting to that triangle? And then there's this piece of thing. Is that, does that look like blood? No, oh my God. Uh, I mean, you just wander, you wander. I think that's the kind of dialogue initially that you, you, you were trying, you know, yeah. that, that you were asking for, right? I mean, I think. I love that. That sounds great. Well, it's just, it's one way of, of approaching works of art yep. uh, that I think is really, really useful because people don't see, as you said, they don't see visually now. No. Uh, they, they, they see verbally, but very rarely visually. So you have to get somebody with words to just relax and talk in front of the picture. Yes. Well said. I think also, though, that, yes, uh, more people have uh, a developed verbal understanding than a developed visual understanding, but probably also they have more visual understanding than they 
realize, but they don't uh, trust their own yeah. responses. And so they also need encouragement to, you know, not be afraid to, to say the wrong thing or make a mistake or, uh, or for it to be embarrassing. Right. Can I say something? Um, I was thinking about, you know, Wittgenstein talks about how language can be a kind of spider web. And I think artists can, can get behind, underneath the language in a sense. I remember a time before I knew any words as a baby, as a child, and I drew, I sketched things. It was very small. And, and then when I developed language, you know, I, it was almost on, like on, on the surface of the water. It, was, it wasn't the same. It was, there was something deeper. And I think we can take people to a place more direct with nature than language can take you. Where if you do a landscape painting of a, a tree, well, like Wittgenstein said, going back to him, when he put, took a matchbox and he put his class, he said, what is this? And somebody said, a matchbox. And he threw it at him and hit it. He said, no, it's that. That's what it is. It's not a matchbox. It's a thing. And sometimes people, we see the world through words because we've evolved, as Chomsky talks about, to have syntax and language, but it can trap people. And artists, I think, can take people off those highways, those high-speed highways of language that are they're cliche, they're filled with cliche, and they're easy. They have to be that way so people can easily communicate, but we can take them off road in a sense and say, look at this. Look at what I'm looking at. It makes you feel less lonely, and they feel less lonely with a great poem. Makes me, you know, you read a Robert Frost poem or Emily Dickinson, you think, wow, I feel the same way on the deepest level. And I think that that we, that's the freedom. You know, we talk about the freedom you feel. I did a sculpture called Freedom, but it was, I felt, I don't want to be constrained, you know, by whether culturally or, I mean, you're aware of it. I'm a commission artist, so I have to think about how I'm going to communicate with people and I'm doing a sculpture. Sometimes it's almost propaganda <laughs> when I'm, uh, I'm doing a sculpture. And that's traditional, you know, with a lot of work. If you go all the way back to the ancients, the Egyptians and the Greeks. And, but at the same time, you want to make something beautiful and, and that has lyrical, musical qualities. You know, you, the arts have, I think, forms that they, that they share. Like I look at my sculpture, I look for repetition, like you might have a music or rhymes, like, like, but not maybe exact rhymes, like in, in poetry, where I look for um, forms and, and, and the balance of, of what Nietzsche called the Apollo and Dionysus. So that it's not all verb, you know, it has an intellectual aspect, but also has a non, we were just talking, you were talking earlier about the nonverbal, emotional, you know, and, um, you know, desire to, uh, I don't know, to, to wipe my hair, you know, and fear of death and all the rest of it. They said the obit, you know, all of that. So, anyway, uh, to me, communication is important. I, I do want to do therapy. I actually did it when I was in college, <laughs> in a hospital. But I don't want to do it for me, and I don't want to sculpt just for myself. You know, I'm sculpting with an audience in mind. I want to communicate to people and say, you know, I feel kind of alone in the world. Are you there too? Do you, you know, do we share something? I'm very, very. I feel like the more personal I get in my work, the more universal it'll be because we're all there underneath it all, in a sense. Thanks, Mark. What's your biographer's view on this? Well, I think whoever wrote the topic for this uh, this dialogue and dialogues, I think what they were actually talking about mostly was this private, private, closed language that Mandarin critics use. And I have to say that I, I like Mandarin criticism myself sometimes, uh, sometimes very much. But I also understand the resentments and people feel about it being sort of an elitist philosophical jargon. Um, a language of its own that takes you away from the art finally rather than bringing you to it. Um, so, and I think that there are many other ways to think about art, some of them verbal, some of them nonverbal, and one of them is biography. Um, but a, a good biography can, of, of a, the artist's life, can I think help illuminate the work and the art, but it's also filled with all kinds of dangers, and that's actually the dangers is what I would enjoy hearing you respond to because it seems to me that in our culture of celebrity over reverence for artists really money vulgar salacious detail all these things uh 
become dialogues when you think about the life of an artist or an individual artist, this worshipful quality that is sometimes directed at, at especially elderly artists, um, is really not very useful about looking at art. And uh, it's a strange thing, uh, quite complicated to understand. Um, so I, 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 I think that you can um, learn a lot by studying the life of an artist, especially about that, that thing about artists becoming artists, meaning somehow almost, almost religious figures in our culture. Um, quite interesting. And a biography can explore that. A biography can also explore the work, but you have to be very, very careful because you don't want to reduce the art to the life. I mean, uh, de Kooning, for example, had a terrible mother, but a lot of people have terrible mothers and they don't become Kooning. So, you know, uh, the fact that de Kooning had a terrible mother is important and you can address it in his work up to a point because it's not just about terrible mothers. Anyway, so I, I'd be curious what you all think about this strange reverence uh, that people have for the figure of, of the artist in our society and the dialogue that they seem to want to engage in with artists. I mean, I, as just as a, as a writer, sometimes people at newspapers, magazines, wherever, they always want you to write about, you know, they want you to interview the artist, talk about the artist. And if you want to talk about the art, well, you know, not so much. Uh, <laughs> it's harder. You know, it's too hard. <laughs> they want to hear how much the, the painting cost. They want to know about the sex life of the artist. They want to know if the artist can make some jokes. Um, the art, well, you know, okay, maybe a little bit at the end, second to last paragraph. Um, that's sort of pop journalism. Uh, and it's it's really pretty annoying and a, and a problem. And so I, I just enjoy hearing what you all say about it. I can respond. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just, you know, thinking, of course, you know, in modern culture, we, we want to find the human person behind the art. We want to get to know them. We want to understand them but also to understand their art. I mean, like where, where does like this darkness come from? Why, why is someone the way they, they are? Um, I have a, a friend who is a phenomenal composer, artist, visual artist, um, you know, performer, Lara Arbach, and her art and her is so dark sometimes. And, and it looks like it's, it's rather even twisted in ways that I, I, I see this darkness and I know her and I, and she's not this kind of person. So I, I, I wonder where it comes from. Where is the root? Well, you know, she probably is somewhere the kind of person. Right. Uh, right. In fact, one of the interesting things about the lives of artists is that uh, it's true of almost everybody, by the way, but the artists are broken people almost always in some way or another. And they're trying to let the light in through the breaks. Uh, and, and um, I think that, people who are not artists in reading about that, just as you say, and when they see that darkness and they see that darkness confronted, engaged and illuminated and actually made into work in part, um, they, they do feel a sense of community. Mm. What uh, Barry was talking about maybe uh, right in the beginning, the feeling of, of a larger aspiration towards making something out of this, this darkness and this break. That, uh, that people have in their sensibilities. So yeah, I think if you do it right, I mean, but again, you can always do, you can, people do it so badly often. They, they, they make it just salacious, vulgar, or crappy and stupid. And, you know, um, they just don't take the- That's true that the artist, the, the artist can become a kind of totem uh, around which this uh, would be community gathers and it can happen at a you know on a much more sophisticated level than this sort of pop journalism they yeah, talking definitely. about. Uh I was reading and I now I wish I had the exact text here in front of me, but I don't but I was reading recently uh this memoir that was recently published by Edith Schloss, who was, you know, as you know, uh was part of the de Kooning circle and she was a right. critic and so on. And uh, there were some passages in it that were very interesting because it was clear going back to the 50s how in this circle of people around de Kooning, a kind of offhand remark that he would make about something would actually determine Edith's uh, attitude toward it, toward that thing that he made the remark about for years uh, because he had so much authority in, in his artistry. And um, 
there, there is something a little bit, um, you know, there's, there's an irrationality to, to our, uh, our engagement with art and with artists that, uh, you know, that's not only the cheap irrationality, but there's also a kind of uh, the irrationality of people who are much more deeply involved with it. Yeah, an aspirational rationality. Yeah, you know. yeah that's, that's true. Um, but it is, I mean, there is a magical aura around artists now, which is quite interesting and peculiar. If you look at, the, for example, the, you know, Jasper Johns, he's not an easy artist. Um, he's not a, a poppy kind of artist, really. Uh, and yet, he's regarded as this kind of, you know, um, what is it? A, a, a sort of a, a mysterious Buddha figure who, mm-hmm. who, who emits these uh, beautiful rays that none of us can quite understand, but that we admire enormously. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's that kind of aura around him, which yeah. I think you can make fun of um, uh, as well, but you can respect it too, because I think, as you say, Barry, it, 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 it reflects a desire, a, a good desire, uh, of, for people to join together in contemplation of something that is interesting and larger than themselves. I mean, I think that's the, that's the aspiration. That's the better and deeper kind of thing. I mean, Coleridge, I, I forget all the, where he said this, but he, he, he was speaking uh, that there was, there could be a clarity was the word he used uh, of people uh, who sort of uh, are involved with thinking in the way that artists do and with appreciating art in a higher way. And I think they, they made up, they made together a kind of community. And I think artists really feel that, don't you? I mean, don't you? I mean, I, I feel like I'm friends almost with certain artists I've never met and certain artists long dead. Mm. Um, they become a kind of a community in your head uh, and they keep you from becoming lonely. Yeah. Don't you think? I mean, writers and yeah. musicians also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Elena, what's, oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think we should go ahead and make sure everybody gets their turn. Elena, what's, how do you see this from the, yeah, the performer's viewpoint? Well, it's interesting that we started to to get to that point of real communication with between the art and the audience and our interaction with the artist, which is exactly sort of the natural flow into the music conversation because uh, you know, Victor Hugo once said, um, music expresses that which cannot be put into words and that which cannot remain silent. So it's, it's, music is really the most open language to me that there is. It's, it's uh, the most natural form of human communication. Um, you know, the, the Neanderthals had a flute and there's a flute that predates cave paintings even, you know, back in, back in time. And, you know, we would do things as people, as Neanderthals, dance around the fire, we would sing, you know, rituals, we sing lullabies to, to our kids. So music is one of the most natural expressions that we have as, as people, as animals. And, you know, with that, music also opens communication because language is, in a sense, it's tonal, it's musical, it's inflection, you know, and music goes a step beyond that because it expresses um, and conveys emotion which is greater than something that language can actually convey with words. Um, and as a performer of music and as a creator of music, I, I find myself so lucky to be able to tap into that power to both release that emotion for myself <laughs> and also to share that with the audience to make someone else feel that power, feel that transformation. You know, I've had people come up to me after and say, oh, this was exactly, you know, the song my grandmother sang to me. Um, And now I'm reconnecting with her and it's releasing all this emotion. And it's so every piece becomes something special to someone. And it has this real kinetic energy that you can tap into and and connect directly with the audience. I can connect with the music. I can connect with the audience and be that that conduit. by which an emotion can be expressed and conveyed forward, which is an immensely uh, fulfilling uh, and, you know, tall order. It's a, it's a difficult task. So we work very hard to create and hone this performance to make sure that it's the best that it can be um, and that it does have that transformative power. 
So you can, and our interpretation is where we have that power with the language of that interpretation to either have a positive effect or maybe not such a great effect. And I say that really in context of not no longer as an individual, but as a production of an opera, for example, overall, because uh, the composer had imagined something he gave us, they gave us uh, instructions, stage directions, everything. And then it is up to us to interpret that and to deliver that to the audience. And what's been happening lately in the music industry, there's been quite a bit of confusion with that, with, with the role of, oh, do we still want to put on traditional operas or is that too boring for people? Do we need to recreate them um, in some new stick to, to put on a totally different statement, maybe something that the composer did not intend? Or do we put on only contemporary operas? Because clearly, you know, that's topical for where we are today. So we talk, we, we present social issues, maybe we shock the, the people, you know, so th there's so much confusion. Do we amplify the social issues? Do we uh, rethink old works or never perform Madame Butterfly again by Puccini, which is a phenomenal work, but it portrays um, the Asian culture, perhaps in a very limited fashion. Is that okay to perform or not? Um, and there's a lot of debate about this in, in the music world. Um, and, you know, as performers, we're afraid to speak out because we have views. We, we believe music and art um, are always a little bit controversial. They always have to exist, but we always have to stay true to the art form, true to ourselves and, and, and perform with dignity the message that we want to deliver to make society better, to make uh that communication happen to to create uh, something that is actually a positive impact rather than a negative impact for for the world, and so the future of music and culture is really in our in our hands. And you know, I feel you know it's my duty to create art that is going to be positive, to create music that is going to have the positive impact. So I'm actually working to create a performance company that will do that, um, and that will. Um, will be both innovative and a rich and immersive experience for everybody. So it's going to serve right by, by the composers, the production itself, and the artists as well. So there's not going to be these productions that are alienating to the audience, that, are, um, that have negative impact for the future of art and music overall. Um, because I think now we need music more than ever because it has such an amazing healing power um, it's, a, it has the power to reconnect us, um, and to express all those emotions that we feel, um, and all that pain that we feel today. Like, you know, during COVID in uh, Italy, they had people singing in balconies, singing, you know, Verdi to, to uplift their spirits and to give them strength, to give, to give themselves strength, uh, and courage. These are very, very important, um, roles of music. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to make sure that we, we, we do present that to the world and that we connect the world through music because it is a universal language. This is, this is what we need. So some thoughts. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I mean, I think with opera, it's and this, let's say this particular problem that you bring up of butterfly, it yeah. seems to me that part of the problem has to do with the fact that it's a, it's a genre in which there's a fairly closed repertoire. I mean, new operas are being written and produced, uh, but they're not entering into the repertory, you know, and so they're produced once and then you never hear about them again. Uh, if there were 10 operas with uh, fascinating, fully rounded Asian characters, uh, the fact that there's one opera that has a stereotyped Asian character wouldn't be so momentous. You know, it would just be part of a bigger uh, spectrum of, of representations, but it becomes uh, really harmful because of the fact that that's the only Asian character in any of the regularly performed operas. Well, Barry, it's interesting. I mean, there's actually uh, there's a lot of new Asian operas that are put on that show the the uh, some of the 
mythology um, and the power of Asians. It's just they're not mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, and one, I think one mistake that the opera industry is making is uh, creating this perception that Madame Butterfly is about the stereotype. It has nothing to do with the music that's in there. It has nothing to do with the love story. It has nothing to do with the pain and the injustice because this opera is actually really about the pain, the injustice, war, and what happens. And the how you portray the stereotype in this opera is so um, up to the director rather than, you know, the it, it's, it, it was not intended in the work to, mm -hmm. to stereotype anybody. It was just how it was performed. So this mm -hmm. is that interpretation piece. We can have a positive or negative impact. And it's up to us to make sure that we do have a positive impact. So, you know, rather than never hear Puccini again, you know, I, I would love to have that work put on with, with, a, with a proper lens uh, to be able to, to, to carry that uh, message across. It's like saying, you know, Cosi uh, Fantute, which is a classic Mozart opera, you know, they, they go to a brothel, you know, <laughs> you know, there's, 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 there's pieces to every opera and every, in lots of artistic um, places that, 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 you know, paintings that show, you know, horrific things that can be, can be created and positioned as part of the story that makes sense um, as part of the story that, uh, that, ha that has a greater, bigger message uh, rather than focus on it. And this, you know, and this, it's all, it has to, has to do with um, interpretation and making sure that we, we create the right, the narrative, the, correct, the right language to translate. Well, I think the, um, what you're talking about with the opera ha has happened in a lot of the arts with literature and uh, certainly with sculpture. For me, I've already had a sculpture that was taken down because the person I sculpted, you know, wasn't, uh, was, was hated by ha a third of maybe Philadelphia, another third loved them and another third didn't care. And um, so, you know, a lot of sculptures are, and, and not just sculptures, but books and other things are being reexamined, Huckleberry Finn and, you know, and so on. And, and, you know, what do you do with those? And, and I have a concern about it because I don't think, I think this a purification kind of thing is a little dangerous, like Pol Pot or something. Let's go through and let's, you know, destroy. I think that the, like the French Revolution went a little too far, maybe a lot too far. Uh, but I think there's certainly, um, for example, I'm working on a sculpture now that may re be replacing Marbury Lee, I'm one of a couple of people in, in the U.S. Capitol. I think he should be replaced. I'm glad his sculpture's down. I wish that uh, Jefferson Davis wasn't still in the U.S. Capitol. What is he doing in there as a statue? But uh, And Mississippi has to do that. But I think that not everybody, the sculpture I did, was someone said, well, he was a politician. He was racially polarizing in his life. I said to them, okay, wait, let's have a dialogue here. He's not Robert E. Lee. Because somebody said, well, we're taking down Robert E. Lee. Let's also take down, I sculpted a Frank Rizzo. And I, and I said, I wouldn't do it now. I wouldn't sculpt it out. But back when I did it, um, I said, you know, the, it didn't seem to be a problem for a lot of people. For some it was. But I thought, why don't we talk about it? Let's have a dialogue. Because if we just take it down, then there'll be no dialogue. And everybody who hated him will still hate him. Everybody who loved him will still love him. There'll be no reaching across of minds at all. And the, and the indifferent people will stay indifferent. And... Um, cause I, at, towards the end, when people tried to tear the sculpture down and they were endangering being hurt, if it fell over, people die that way. Sometimes I said, let's take it down. Let's do it properly. And, um, but I, I'm concerned, you know, like looking at Heidegger and others, you know, he was a Nazi, but he, he had there was great philosophy there too. Can you separate the two? But going back to Robert E. Lee, I said, I think that you have to allow, have capital punishment in art be for the extremes like Lee, and then you got to leave room for various levels of, of punishment. Like, I don't think Ulysses S. Grant should have been torn down in San Francisco. It was a sculpture of him because he did more to eradicate slavery than probably even Lincoln. And then Lincoln was taken down. That was another. And I know it's complicated because, you know, the, the gesture seemed a little bit like he was, uh, uh, you know, looking down at the, at the slave. But he was it's it's they're not on the same level. We have to decide what those levels are. But you can't cut everybody's head off, I think, or say, okay, let's not do any more biographies and literature of people who are evil. We need to know about them too. 
And in my the sculpture I did, I said, let's let's talk, uh, let's put up some bronze plaques of people who say why people loved him, other why people hated him, um, and have context, and then put up a sculpture near of someone that was a kind of political um, antithesis of him. Uh, it was a man named Sullivan here who helped create the anti-apartheid situation in, in, you know, for South Africa and that kind of thing. So there, there's, there's context, you know, and um, so anyway, that's, I, I just think that's something that we're going through now. What do we do with all these, you know, some sculptures are being replaced and, and, um, and, and they need to be, but others, I'm just a little concerned about, you know, every, all heads rolling. It's a little, well, what what little, do you think about the idea that uh, when it comes to public sculpture, often the most discussion around it takes place twice. Once when it's going to be put up, mm -hmm. and then when somebody wants to take it down. But in between, people just kind of walk, tend to walk by it. In and, between, it's mostly pigeons. Yeah. yeah. Well, that happened with my piece. It's a, it was a 10-foot statue, and when it first went up... His political adversary for, for mayor um, gave me a nice speech about it and him and came to. But then later he changed his mind. I changed my mind about it. But um, in time, you know, you can you can you can change. I would have sculpted Robert E. Lee 20 years ago, but I wouldn't do it today. And I've turned down a couple of sculptures of presidents, three presidents and a couple of uh, people on the Supreme Court that I didn't want to sculpt. But also, you're younger and you're an artist and you're hungry and you need you have to think, you know, about economics. You know, the ethics of stealing bread to feed your children is which worse? Let your your family starve or, you know, do the scope, do, you know, steal the bread. And I it was easier for me to turn down uh, other commissions since then because I didn't need the money. So I wasn't desperate. So I could be a little bit more high minded about it. But um, I think there's a lot of complexity. Life is messy. You know, as you get older, you realize it's not all black and white. It's easier sometimes, I think, for, and I was younger, when you're younger to, to be pure about it. But um, life is messy. And, and like with Jefferson, you know, do we have sculptures? We have sculptures, Jefferson. Do we take them down because he had slaves? Um, you know, there are other people who had slaves who we don't have, who didn't do what he did, help create a country and write the Declaration of Independence and so on. So all that has to be thought about. It's very, it's a lot of gray and a lot of um, complexity and messiness in, yeah. in real life. And art can reflect that. And, can be, and that's where the dialogue needs to take place, I think. Otherwise, we're all look, talking past each other and we're still mad at each other. And, you know, and uh, so. All right. Well, uh, thanks very much. I think that's a good place to, to end it on. We're actually, I think, about uh, 15 minutes over our, our allotted time. So... Uh, we've given our listeners plenty to chew over and given each other uh, plenty to chew over as well. Uh, so thanks all of you and look forward to continuing these dialogues in other times and places in other ways. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, great. It was fun. It was great. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.